here at UTS. We are a think tank devoted to the Australia-China relationship. And we're dealing, given the China panic that Australia's been through, we're dealing with a challenging subject, and that is China and democracy. But we are honoured to have one of the world's leading theorists of democracy, uh, John Keane. John, among his many other achievements and qualities, is the author of a biography of Tom Paine, a significant figure in the American Revolution, and before that, in the, uh, uh, in the, in, in the uh, French Revolution and in the American Revolution. And um, a, very, a very significant and romantic figure, Tom Paine being a, a hero to many, many Democrats and of huge influence in America especially. John Keane is Professor of Politics at the University of Sydney and at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, Distinguished Professor at Peking University. He's the Director and Co-Founder of the Sydney Democracy Network. Um, members of the Sydney Democracy Network here tonight? Uh, members here? Well, you're very welcome and, and uh, we, we value our association with you. He's written for the New York Times, Al Jazeera, the Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian, Harper's, the South China Morning Post, and the Huffington, Huffington Post. He's speaking tonight about his most recent book, When Trees Fall, Monkeys Scatter, 2017. John, great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. Well, Dajia um, Wanchang Hao. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I wanted to say Fei Chang Gang Xi, UTS de Yao Qing. Thank you very much for the invitation, and especially to, to Bob, to Daniel Bolger, who has been um, the invisible but impeccable organizer of this event, and also to Professor He Bao Gang, who has been traveling, braving airports just to be here with us tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, to, to each of you, and thank you for coming. Um, I have to say that I have never before uh, addressed an audience in, in such a venue that has been described in the following way. May I quote? A Beijing-backed propaganda outfit disguised as a legitimate research institute whose ultimate objective is to advance the Chinese Communist Party's influence in Australian policy and political circles. An organization hosted by a university whose commitment to academic freedom and proper practice is clouded by money hunger and directed by an ex-politician suffering from relevance deprivation syndrome who cannot see what a valuable asset he has uh, become for Beijing. Uh, this is quite a long sentence. Why and, did you accept your invitation? Uh, well, I, I wanted to say that those words are the words, and I'll mention him only once, Professor Clive Hamilton, who I have come to call more recently Professor Snape. Um, <laughs> it, it, if, you, if you know Harry Potter, you'll know that Professor Snape um, was the professor of the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And I want to say tonight a few things about um, his uh, view of uh, uh, relations between Australia and China, but I want actually to try my hand at four things. The first is um, that I want to say something about this so-called rise of China. Uh, I want to say something about empire, global politics, um, and the way that I think um, a fresh imaginary, a fresh way of thinking about China and relations with China is now becoming mandatory. That's the first thing that I would like to do. The second, as uh, Chinese people say, I'd like to try to pull a tooth or two from the um, tigers of orthodoxy by saying something about what China is not. That is, I want to say a few words um, so to say, methodologically and conceptually about um, the mistakes uh, that are commonplace when trying to interpret, to make sense of this a very complex polity which is uh, now a global empire called uh, China. Third, I want to say why it is that I chose this title for the book When Trees Fall, Monkeys uh, Scatter. It's an old Chinese proverb 
um, that uh, is about the problem of power and the legitimacy of power. And I want to say um, in this third section why it is that it's important, uh, so to say, like an anthropologist uh, would, to pay attention to details of institutions and daily life which uh, many millions of people uh, in China call democratic. And fourth, I want to say something about um, the long-term political implications of uh, all of this uh, for China in the wider world. And I want to do all this in about 23 minutes uh, flat. Uh, here I uh, go. I um, think it's no news to you that we're living in very exceptional times, it never happened before, that two empires, globally entangled, um, are now uh, a part of what we call the globalization process or world politics. Um, the word empire, of course, uh, causes embarrassment in the United States. Donald Rumsfeld, you remember, said uh, famously under the George W. Bush period, we don't seek empires, we're not imperialistic, we never have been, a bit short on memory. Um, and in China, the word di, di guo uh, also is typically not used to describe Chinese power in the world, but it's used to describe the past, you know, the problem of shaking off empire. What I submit is that if um, this is a rough working dish, definition of an empire, that it seems to me that we have um, two empires that are entangled. The last two empires were not, the Soviet Union and the United States, um, and that this is now part of the, um, uh, the global order uh, in which we find ourselves. And I could detail, we can have a discussion about the symptoms of empire, the, the markers of empire, but they seem to me to be uh, very uh, clear. And it is this dynamic that is causing um, among the friends of the United States um, and their allies and partners, there is something like a panic attack happening about this, um, this development, which is by no means um, finished. There is, as Stephen Fitzgerald, our first ambassador to China, points out, a great churning of East and West going on, and it's remarkable. But what is also striking is the way in which there are some sharpening their swords about this dynamic, who want actually a Cold War, who stir up uh, public sentiments against what they call the authoritarianism of the Chinese regime, sometimes they call it totalitarian, who see that there are um, uh, acts of, of silent espionage and systematic takeovers, uh, takeovers of all kinds of bodies happening outside of China, who warn of threats to sovereignty and the coming end of liberal democracy. This is, of course, Professor Snape's uh, view of things. They contain uh, in my view, uh, some validities. They remind us that empires um, are never angels on earth, that empires are missions to change uh, the world and to shape people's lives in their own uh, material interests. And I think it's also interesting that this um, attempt to stir up a new Cold War is uh, a marker of the end of the engagement uh, project with China, the presumption Bill Clinton said it very clearly that if we could engage China peacefully and encourage market reforms that they would become just like us. This I think is now over and hence um, the panicked reactions um, of intellectuals and journalists here and elsewhere about um, uh, who try to make sense of this uh, period, never before has it happened in human history, of two genuinely global empires that are entangled. I have problems, uh, I have to uh, say, and in, in very summary form with this attempt to stir up um, uh, trouble about China. I do think that uh, this position underestimates the entanglement and probably the irreversible entanglement of these two empires. Uh, this is true in political economy terms, it's true in culture, it's true in terms of diasporas. I also think that um, its sense of history is very poor. There is a great book by John uh, Darwin called After Tamerlane, which is a history of empires, that shows that actually the way we in the West have talked about empires is very Orientalist. 
and that we typically think of ourselves in terms of the rise of the West under modern conditions. When you read um, John Darwin, you will see that actually it's a good deal more complicated, and it forces us to think about the significance of this um, emergence of China as a global power. I think it's also um, worth saying very bluntly that talk, uh, getting tough with China talk, attracts racists and xenophobes. That uh, is uh, certainly a danger of this um, politics uh, because um, it uh, effectively is a cry calling for the West to stay on top and to sort out who is the uh, uh, top empire. I think this, this, um, uh, this uh, Cold War mentality r r depends upon cliches, zombie words I call them like liberal democracy and authoritarianism. Um, it's also striking for me that this um, push that I'm trying to summarize um, underestimates the dangers that it will reinforce the two emperor trends. Have you not noticed that these two empires are showing signs of having two emperors? Um, one uh, called Donald Trump and the other uh, used to be called Xi Dada. Uh, there is also, I think, um, uh, a blindness about the disfiguring of democracy that's happening in the heartlands of democracy. Uh, the Cold Warriors um, speak about democracy proudly as if we're the custodians of it and they are not. Um, the whole history of the American empire and its fraught relationship with democracy um, is usually uh, not uh, discussed. And worst of all, it seems to me, in this new rhetoric of a Cold War is a kind of blindness, a willful ignorance about um, questions to do with what China is. And this brings me to the second uh, point, a uh, big point that I wanted uh, to say a few words about. This book, When Trees Fall, Monkey Scatter, worries its head about the problem of how to make sense of a very complex kaleidoscopic polity that we call uh, China. Um, and it raises some objections to standard interpretations and ways of typical ways of thinking about uh, uh, China. Its aim is to induce um, among readers, I hope you will uh, read it, a sense of wonder about the complexity uh, and a realization that China is not always what it seems, that even China um, is uh, China is a state of mind that, as Stephen Fitzgerald says, we have to learn the art of thinking in Chinese about China, not in order to give in to everything that we don't like, but because we need better ways of stepping into the shoes of others, so to say. China, in other words, is much more than full rice bowls and steel girders and shopping malls and tourists and anti-corruption drives and strong leaders. It's possible, I say in this book, that this system has a good deal more durability than many observers uh, suppose. Uh, there is, uh, as you uh, may well uh, know, there is something like a fray struggle going on uh, outside of China about the key terms that are best used to grasp its dynamics. Slavoj Zizek, uh, the Bolshevik, a uh, clown um, likes to say that China is a straightforward case of state capitalism. Uh, Xi, in his um, 19th Party Congress uh, address, says, by contrast, this is a socialist people's democracy. Some people speak of China as a kleptocracy. I think this is a serious uh, misdescription. Crony capitalism, min sin pei, autocracy, totalitarianism. Um, all of this, these terms seem to me to be uh, not uh, helpful. And the one that I target in this book is the concept of authoritarianism. It's not a time for um, sustained reflection on Samuel Huntington's uh, coining of that term. But um, what's important to know is that around 1970, Samuel Huntington, who had a real ear and eye for neologisms, you know, clash of civilizations, third wave of democracy, um, developed this distinction between democracy, it had an American accent, liberal democracy, and authoritarianism. And basically, the whole point uh, that he wanted to make is that democracies have free and fair elections, authoritarianism doesn't, and China, um, it follows, 
does not fit into the category of democracy. What I uh, want uh, to do uh, in uh, the remainder of this lecture is to actually contest that term. I think it is a zombie term. I think that there are some normative objections to it. You know, are we prepared to say that American liberal democracy in these years of the 21st century is the normative standard for power sharing and governing? Are we? Well, that's what Huntington um, insisted upon. I also think that it's, um, it's a term, it's a dualism that actually represents, a, it's a serious misrepresentation, a misdescription of realities on the ground, so to say, in China. To attack this concept of authoritarianism, to open up um, a discussion about what kind of polity China is in all of its complexity um, is uh, to not uh, turn a blind eye to the dark sides of this polity. You know these very well. They are covered every day uh, by journalists. This is indeed a one-party system. This is a system in which there's a lot of embedded secrecy. There's a lot of party doublespeak. Post-truth is not an American invention. Um, there is a lot of self-censorship. There are secret business fiefdoms. There's tax evasion. There's a growing gap between rich and poor. One third of wealth in China is now in the hands of about 1% of the population. It has plutocratic qualities. There are repression. There's repression of uh, religious groups. Um, there are land grabs. There's the problem of Xinjiang and Tibet. Um, there's a crackdown on lawyers and so on. This has to be admitted. Um, and in the book I say this very clearly, which is quite possibly a reason why it cannot be translated um, in uh, Shanghai or Beijing, but we will see. Um, the book tries, one last comment about this second point, about how to avoid, or the mistakes to be avoided. It's very important, it seems to me, and I try to say at length in this book, that bearing in mind the contradictoriness of this polity called China is very important conceptually and methodologically. Um, here, um, the wise remark of Yu Hua, who is, I think, one of contemporary China's greatest political writers, uh, please do read his China in 10 words, recently gave an interview in which he says, I'm always asked, what is China? And I say, it's a bit like this. You go into the lobby of any hotel in China, one star to five stars, and there will be a table in which there's a no smoking sign, and next to it will be an ashtray. This is this is uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is the so-called reality that um, China um, uh, is. And I try to grasp through uh, our critique of this simplifying concept of authoritarianism. I have um, a lot of things to say about the current story of the moment, about the so-called new Maoism, about. Xi Jinping's um, uh, push with uh, supporters from Zhejiang and Fujian to abolish uh, term limits. But that and its consequences uh, we can perhaps talk about in, um, in the discussion. I want to say, however, one thing that hasn't been discussed as far as I can see in media reports on these developments in China. And that is that um, the power grabbing is bound up it seems to me, in the Xi group, and at actually all levels in the system within the party, is bound up with an anxiety about loss of power. And hence the title of the book, Shu Dao Hu Sun San, When Trees Fall, Monkeys Scatter, decoded what I'm trying to say, and it applies, it seems to me, to this push uh, for centralized control at the top, is a fear that if people uh, millions of Chinese people withdraw their consent, withdraw their loyalty, then the system collapses. The trees fall, and if the trees fall, then not only 7% of the population, 90-some million Chinese citizens will scatter. Everybody's lives will be damaged and transformed, and lives outside of China as well. And hence, hence, um, the report that Xi Jinping's favorite, one of his favorite uh, jokes is the joke about Brezhnev. Um, you know that Xi uh, commissioned a year-long inquiry into why the Soviet Union collapsed. And um, this joke comes from this. So it's the story of 
um, Brezhnev becoming first party secretary. He's installed in the Kremlin, and his mother, a very simple woman from the countryside, comes to visit him. With tears in her eyes, she says, my son, Leonid Ilyich, I am so proud of you. You live in such a big house, and you have black cars. But I, I worry about one thing. What do you worry about, mother? I worry, my son, what will you explain to the communists? Uh, this this, this um, fear of the loss of power, uh, this presumption that you know, people are like water, and they can float boats, but they can overturn them, runs very deep through the uh, Communist Party of China at all levels. Um, it is certainly an ingredient in the anti-corruption drive, and I would say it's certainly much stronger than it ever was inside the Soviet empire. This is um, uh, another uh, topic for discussion. Um, third point. I want to say something about locally made democratic practices. And here it's uh, something like an anthropologist coming um, to observe the language people are using and the customs uh, that they uh, uh, live. Um, and what I want to do is to give you uh, six or seven examples that I describe in some detail and analyze in the book at length of what locally is called uh, minchu, democracy, beginning with the most obvious, which is that any visit to China, you will see this I took in Shanghai a few months ago, you will see banners, you will see uh, big uh, posters, you will hear talk constantly that the party uh, is the servant of the people, that the true source of authority in this system are the sovereign people. What could be more uh, democratic than that? And um, you may know that this um, is infused in a lot of multimedia settings. Um, this is um, In the Name of the People, 2017, uh, evidently watched. It's a 50-part uh, series. Uh, with nearly two billion uh, viewers, and it's basically about an anti-corruption drive, the way that a unit tracks down party members who are totally corrupted. You know, there are, there are guys who sleep on beds of RMB because they don't know where to, to, to hide them. Um, and this, um, you know, so this is an instance of the way in which talk of the people is uh, chronic and um, commonplace. Second feature. Um, fa zhe, rule of law. One of the striking things about China um, is the lawlessness uh, that is well recorded, the arrest of human rights lawyers, the disappearances that happen, um, the corruption um, that um, is embedded in so many institutions, but also striking is the way that the party at all levels speaks the language of rule of law. And not only that, but um, allows uh, rule of law practices to operate inside of China and in the institutions that China is currently building. Um, the regime has built more than 20 multilateral institutions in the last two decades. It's a, it's, it's a friend of multilateralism. And almost every one of these has a rule of law component. The AIIB, of which Australia is um, a uh, uh, creditor signatory, um, has, um, it has uh, an integrity unit built into it. Um, again, uh, why does the party um, follow rule of law in certain institutions, and why does it speak about rule of law, democratic language? Again, the thesis is because actually it knows the dangers of lawlessness. It knows the dangers of the corrupting effects of power uh, when unconstrained uh, by law. And uh, this, um, oh, I meant to just show you this, this is uh, Bo Xi Lai. Um, if you want an example of a sort of simulated rule of law, you should have a look at the reports on this uh, trial. Here is uh, Bo, um, surrounded by two very tall policemen, by the way, to show how little he is. You know that um, he gave evidence in his defense in court we know he fainted some 20 times in custody. We know about his corrupted wife. We know about the death, murder of an English, of a British uh, businessman, and so on. Um, the whole thing, there was even live streaming of this uh, trial um, in a kind of simulated 
rule of law, and of course he went down for a very long uh, time. And there is uh, this case which I uh, like to cite. Um, some of you might like golf. Uh, this is uh, in Shenzhen. This is Mission Hills. It's the largest golf course. Actually, there are a dozen of them in China. Um, Mao always thought golf was green opium. Uh, but after the death of Mao, um, thousands of golf courses were built, land disputes, water disputes, to the point where in 2004, um, the party bans the building of more golf courses, uh, and since then some 400 have been built. Um, I mean, this is the kind of strange rule of law lawlessness that is part of what I call phantom democracy in uh, China. Um, third, I'll kangaroo hop through these very quickly because I think the guillotine is coming. Um, more than a million elections have been held in China since the end of the 1980s. Um, and the evidence we have shows, using secret ballots, high turnouts, the party typically gets elected, sometimes it goes wrong, but the evidence is also that this has effects on local government. For example, the willingness to pay uh, taxes and the willingness uh, to root out uh, corruption. There are some signs that the culture of voting spreads in China. Supergirl was a very famous um, uh, entertainment show in which there was online voting. It was uh, shut uh, down. The book uh, details cases where um, an election by secret ballot is used in city contexts to defuse conflicts. Um, when you have a majority uh, who are in favor of development, getting rid of the hutong, then this is the way to do it, by a secret ballot. And you may not know that Alibaba, which is the world's largest um, online retailer, has a democracy day in which um, there is an election by secret ballot uh, of all the employees to set up a public interest committee that decides uh, how to disperse 0.03% of the profits of Alibaba for socially useful purposes. I mean, there's, and this is called Minchu. This is democracy inside Alibaba, which happens to be a rather attractive um, a company for many millions of uh, Chinese. Fourth, not very well researched, is that um, there are these, um, what I call Yulun Ling Shu, uh, independent public opinion leaders. This is uh, Yao Chan. My colleagues at SDN tell me that she's very much yesterday's um, public opinion leader. She was once called the Queen of Weibo. She made remarks against the party. But there are many uh, more examples on the left. Is Jinxing. Um, she uh, was, once upon a time, um, a male colonel in the People's Liberation Army. She had gender reassignment surgery. Um, she has uh, become nicknamed Poison Tongue. She had a show that was watched by many, many millions called Chinese Dating uh, on television, not doing that anymore, and says repeatedly until today she's not scared of the party. She will speak openly. Um, and I could uh, go on. Here is Lei Jun, uh, the founder of uh, Xiaomi, mobile phone company, says he likes to read Mao, likes to wear, you know, Steve Jobs type blue jeans, and so on. These public opinion leaders are interesting um, because the party is reticent about um, arresting or shutting their voices. Uh, and, and the consequence is, or so I claim in this book, that a kind of phantom public is kept alive. These uh, public opinion leaders appeal to a gong. They appeal to a public. They also, I think, change the meaning of leadership. Uh, Ling Dao, in the Mao period, meant the fist, the gun. Uh, these leaders show that actually there can be public opinion leaders whose, whose, uh, whose authority comes from the trust, the loyalty of millions of people to them. And it seems to me that that's quite significant and no discussion of this would be uh, complete without Papi Jiang. Um, uh, occasionally in trouble, 29, 30, big following, more than 100 million, maybe many more than that, um, fast cut video, web platform um, who goes on and on about the, the, the burdens of being a young woman in China today. Parents constantly nagging at you, when are you going to get married? Boyfriends who haven't got a clue uh, about relationships. And um, you know, this, this is part of the so-called reality of China. You may not know, fifth, um, almost finished on these examples, there are an estimated 800 
are public opinion polling agencies in China, half of which are independent of the party, some of which the Pew, Harvard's Pew Research um, uh, Polling uh, Center operates in uh, China. Uh, so does Gallup, so does A.C. Nielsen. Um, these public opinion polling agencies are used by the party at various levels inside the system. I had the pleasure of spending uh, some time with CPOR, with the researchers at CPOR, which is the oldest independent public opinion polling agency in China, in Guangzhou, uh, who described to me the way the party uses public opinion polling and public forums and online petitions and, 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 and so on in order to negotiate, to navigate its way through difficult uh, problems, for example, introducing parking restrictions. Um, it's also um, sixth, almost finished. Uh, there are signs, it seems to me, of the fact that the leadership of the party at various points um, engages in what Americans call showboating. Um, here are two characters, uh, Peng Yuan, I don't have to introduce you to the uh, head of state on the right. Um, uh, she is, don't forget, the strong man is also a master of um, a kind of democratic campaign style uh, politics. Um, he visits a bun shop uh, unscripted. He rides a bicycle with his daughter. When he's in Ireland, he kicks a Gaelic football. And most recently, um, when I was in China, he was in Nanjing, where the media track him um, going into a hutong area where a small modest trader um, catches his eye selling, I think, perfume or a perfume container and insists that, that she takes this as a gift. She refuses and reaches into his pocket and puts 30 RMB down and insists that the trader um, accepts this money and wishes him the best of luck and thanks him for his contributions to uh, the China dream. I mean, this is, this is, this is very much uh, of this kind. Finally, um, and one of the topics that it seems is uh, worth a lecture in itself is the whole question of the media saturation of this polity and the dynamics that are very complicated. Everybody knows in the outside that um, about the censorship. The censorship model is prevalent. I would say that actually you have to take into account the ways in which the party again at many levels uh, tolerates outbursts, um, for example, on Weibo, uh, on WeChat, partly because these are early warning detector systems, teaching the party of trouble that can come, and partly they're just release of steam. But what's clear is that one of the chronic features of the mediated power relations in China is that media storms happen daily. Uh, it, there's an estimated 100,000 a year. It's hard to get uh, the data. But it shows that actually um, the party is learning that once upon a time governing was like hammering a nail into wood and now it's more like, as the Chinese expression has it, um, governing by trying to balance on a slippery egg. And hence the reliance on network public forums, on electronic mailboxes. Um, hence the emphasis on the need for accountability, gong shi. If you read uh, Xi's speech, you will see that he's deeply preoccupied with the importance of bringing greater accountability to the power of uh, the party. Finally, uh, I haven't yet been guillotined, but it's coming. I know I can feel it. I want to say something about the long-term significance of these findings of this anthropological field research, this attempt to challenge the concept of authoritarianism by saying empirically that one thing wrong with it is that it simply underestimates, it turns a blind eye to what are called in China um, democratic forms that are locally uh, made. What is the significance of uh, these, um, of these, uh, uh, of these uh, trends? Um, it's first of all important to say that the evidence seems to me that when millions of Chinese people say they live in a democracy, the Pew uh, surveys suggests that around 
of Chinese people say this. Um, and when they describe um, mechanisms like local elections uh, and opinion polling as democratic, that this is not simply um, a repetition of propaganda. It's not simply um, bread and circuses politics. It's not simply maquillage, as the French say. Then rather, the term that I introduce in the book, it's difficult to translate, is phantom democracy. There's something phantomic about this um, democracy in China. It's a one-party system with a lot of arbitrary power. But it's also a system in which there are these democratic mechanisms that are lived and have a certain palpable quality. They're aspirational. Um, they're a bit like a mirage. This um, is actually um, a mirage from Shandong province. Um, Shenjing is an old Chinese word to describe a mirage. Is a mirage real or not? Well, it defies that very distinction. It's real or not real. What I want to say is that there is, um, that these mechanisms I've been describing are meaningful. They're, as it were, lived illusions. There is unrealized potential. And so the question is, what kind of um, unrealized potential or coming um, future potential do they have? I see three possibilities, and I'll end on this uh, note. One possibility, um, if we had a crystal ball and we looked into this um, Chinese polity and this Chinese empire that is now part of our reality, is that slowly but surely, with setbacks, with some violence, with a lot of pushing and shoving, um, China becomes a large-scale uh, Taiwan. I mean, this um, would be something like what happened. The fate of the party would be something like what happened to Congress Party in India, or what is currently happening to the ANC in South Africa. A slow disintegration of one-party rule, um, a kind of a bullion um, civil society, a growing pluralism, corruption scandals um, that lead to something like what the province of Taiwan, as it's officially called, has become. It is a very unusual democracy. It's multicultural with indigenous rights. It is rule of law. There are free and fair elections. There is an active civil society. And curiously, as I point out in the book, um, you can describe Taiwan as the cuckoo in the nest. I mean, the more that Beijing insists, as she did in the 19th Party address, there is no talk of, of Taiwanese independence, then the irony and the difficulty is that that means as a functioning, what I call monetary democracy, inside China. So this is one option. Second option is that um, we take our cue here from Liang Qichao, uh, one of the great writers of um, turn of the century into the 20th century. You know that uh, Liang Qichao visited Australia uh, as a kind of Tocqueville mission, you know, to come and see what a democracy looked like at the point of federation. Liang Qichao famously said that the first great law of Chinese politics is that the strong always rule the weak. And following from that, one could say, looking into the future, there's a big corruption scandal, or a big bank collapses, or some military escapade out there in the empire goes badly, and the party is challenged. And millions of people come to the streets, and there's a collapse of the regime. Um, it's as if the party dug its own grave. Interestingly, um, there are many China watchers and China scholars who say that this is the only way that this system can be broken. Through revolution, um, collapse, and um, hoping out of the ruins comes something like the Americans call liberal uh, democracy. Um, I don't know um, about the chances, the probabilities of this. None of us know. Um, it is clear that if this were to happen, this would have a major impact on the whole global order, if I am right about this being a unique period of globally entangled empires. Finally, what about the possibility that this one-party system with a phantom democracy, with locally made democratic qualities, and despite everything, survives. And if that's the case, if that's the case, then we shall have to write, 
rewrite the textbooks of political science. Because this would be a one-party system that manages to win sufficient loyalty of the population, um, a system of voluntary servitude, a system that actually has mastered the art of learning how well to govern people with, so to say, um, their consent and loyalty. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm not sure which of these three options uh, are, uh, are likely. Um, we should have a discussion about them, but I want to point out, um, uh, finally, uh, a couple of uh, things. Um, and the one thing, it's the sting in the tail of the book, uh, is this. I don't know if you've thought this or if it occurred to you during my talk that there are more than a few characteristics of the Chinese polity that bear resemblance to the United States. A growing gap between rich and poor, flourishing talk of the people, the reliance on, op on opinion polling and focus groups, the permanent campaigning that is part of the American democracy, the drift towards a post-truth culture, lots of talk of the rule of law mixed with arbitrary power, universal surveillance. I want to ask you, might it be that these Chinese qualities, um, might it be that they're descending on our own democracies? Maybe Sam Huntington got it completely wrong. Maybe China is not the exception. Could it be that maybe China is setting the pace for the future of democracy? Perhaps China is the future of democracy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shishi. <laughs>
differences between China and Australia. Today, Australia is regarded as a democracy. China is being regarded as authoritarianism. So common knowledge is those two systems are in conflict. And it is difficult to make the political compromise those two uh, systems. So this is kind of those kind of common understanding constitutes a basis for Australia foreign policy towards China. And uh, what John wants to do is he asks us a tough question. Is the concept of authoritarianism useful to understand China? Then he suggests, let's forget about it. Let's drop the term authoritarianism. The authoritarian, the term authoritarian is outdated to describe today's China. So if we follow John's suggestion, start with pre-assumption, then we need a completely new, fresh idea how to deal with China, how to develop uh, our kind of more complicated policy towards China, rather than based on China's authoritarian, let's keep the distance from it. So then he also, he further suggests, if China is not, it's not authoritarian, does not, the term authority does not serve as well to, to understand China. What is the alternative? So he gave us a three major concepts in his talk, but I will illustrate it one by one. One is a locally made democracy in China. Second one is a patent democracy. Third one is a monetary democracy. So I will discuss those concepts in each and also discuss the relationship between those uh, concepts. First, John is right to claim that the democracy experiment in China really features as a heady topic in the field of journalism, diplomacy, and academic writing. I think that is absolutely right. Australia failed to understand the ongoing on China, in particular, understand the Chinese democratic experiment. We tend to look at the Chinese democratic experiment as a fake, it's, it's uh, symbolic. And, uh, John tried to fill, a, fill this gap by examining a variety of Chinese locally made democracy, a lot of innovation, even including the party, party in John's book called the Learning Party. The Chinese party always learning something new. The Chinese party's membership is really amazing, the largest in the world. And here I think, indeed, we need to pay attention to a lot of Chinese innovation like participatory budgeting, uh, public healings, village election. In terms of the number of the public healing in China today, is much, much larger frequently held than the Australian local council. And even in terms of participatory budgeting, the, the number of the Chinese participating budget is more frequently held than the local participant budget in, the, in, in Australia too. So, so all those things, what are, what are any, John also talking about this kind of uh, public opinion poll. He's he talking about the public opinion leaders. Then he put together, he calls those a patent democracy. Okay. And he challenges the existing theoretical framework. The current tell you there's a few theoretical frameworks available. Understand, one is a meritocracy. See, China development meritocracy. So John does not like it. And there's another term called uh, uh, res responsive authoritarianism. So as I said, John suggests we better give up the term authoritarianism. And uh, so, let, let, let me just uh, think that in, that, in those, all those areas, is, uh, as I just said, John is a kind of really political theory, kind of conceptualize the Chinese new development, development make some uh, really challenge and make, make a number of extremely important questions I will discuss later on. But uh, first, let's look at his idea called the locally made democracy. And certainly, John is right. There are many cases of the locally made democracy. And he regarded those locally made democracy as a form of uh, a patent democracy. So 
while there are truths that uh, those locally made democracy can come from Chinese resources, initiative, driving force, or some particular feature with Chinese character characteristic, I would like to point out a hybrid process, hybrid uh, product. It's a, if we look closely, what so-called Chinese-made democracy is not pure Chinese-made. Actually, it's a hybrid one. So there's always the case that without help from outside, China might not be able to develop what's so-called locally-made democracy. I, I, I had an opportunity to review, review several big international projects funded by the UIDP, European Union, Asian Foundation, Food Foundation so in the last two decades. So I look at all those uh, their funding projects. Amazing to my surprising. All the Chinese uh, local, what is called local made uh, democracy, covered by newspaper, are actually funded by outside, funded by America, or the European, or even Australia. So, so this is a kind of uh, a fact. I think this is really important to understand this hybridity, this hybridity. And uh, if we look, at that, maybe one area is a kind of intra-party democracy. That's a that's a only Chinese made. Chinese, when it comes to party internal experiment, they don't want outside uh, interfere. But if we look at that one. And you were surprised that we will find those intra-party democracy. Actually, there's nothing happened there. Very limited innovation in the end of the day. So in today, it's very interesting. When the China becomes rich, then China found its own project on a lot kind of uh, innovation, in particular deliberative democracy. They give huge money to scholars, then develop Chinese own grand theorizing of deliberate democracy, what do we find is that they actually move away from democracy. So, so what I've just said in the short, it is a combination of, the, the, it's, it's very interesting, the one point I should have made, those are some genuine democracy at a local level indeed take place, happen. But it's largely due to citizen resistance. So it is a kind of a, a combination of Chinese citizen resistance, struggle, or Western ID support that creates so-called uh, locally made democracy. So that's the first point. The second point is the key concept of the patent democracy. John make a major conceptual contribution when he used the concept patent democracy. How does this turn? differ from other concepts already being used, like fake democracy, cosmetic democracy, in the comparative democratic study literature. Perhaps the, I think the patent democracy, the term patent is, as John said, is a less dismissive, uh, more nuances, more exact way. So when you use a patent democracy, it does not have a negative, it's bad. If it is a fake democracy, it's bad. But pending democracy, there's a subtlety, there's a some function. It's very important. So that's, that's his, uh, uh, I guess, probably his uh, contribution. So in, in particular, he showed that locally made democracy indeed shape, influence, life of meaning of Chinese citizens. I do think he's right on this point. When it comes to village election, it does impact the village. And outside evaluation, people always dismiss village election. As in the end of the day, village election does not give rise to Chinese democratization. So many Western communities immediately dismiss. So, but I think John is right. Let's look at, his, look at those patent democracy from perspective of local Chinese. So that's, that's his important. And, uh, but the, then the issue is that there are several issues, I think, as when it comes to a patent democracy. We really, he raises a so important issue, but he, in his book, haven't examined fully. But I think I'll open those issues for debate. 
One year, she holds this uh, painting democracy, added to literature on the transformation of uh, cosmetic democracy to genuine democracy. So John suggests that in his book, that is, he link this painting democracy to the monetary democracy. So how the painting democracy will and might move into the monetary democracy. But the John uh, needs to tell us the mechanism or conditions for this possibility. So I think this is really important. Second issue, he discussed what are function of a patent democracy. John speculates one possibility, that is a patent democracy trends prove durable. Now, that is a fascinating, important question. As, as when John ended his talk, those patent democracy is a part of democratic life, not only in China. Even in the Western democracy, also have that's a patent democracy. That's a feature of democracy. Now, this is so important issue. But uh, unfortunately, I found he did not address, answer this the in empirically detail. So, so, but uh, indeed, I think this is the issue is so important. The issue is that how can Australia cope with this uh, new empire of the China, with this patent democracy. We can imagine in the, when the Ottoman Empire dominated Europe uh, and Asia, then the, in the several Italy, several small towns have the republic state, free state. So how those free state deal with the em Ottoman Empire at that time? At that time, relative isolation. But today, the, we are increased globalized. How else should I deal with? No, that's the really challenging issue. The other issues for us as, a, as a Australian citizens, we have a duty to address these differences between China and uh, Australia. Do we should recon reconcile this term, patent democracy, or should we just reject it, this uh, patent democracy, as a, as a sort of sophisticated form of fake democracy? It is still fake democracy, but a more sophisticated. That's all. So we reject it. So this is really we need to uh, think about this possibility this issue. Then let let me move to the the third major concept that John talking about monetary democracy. The, the, in his book, uh, Death and the Life of Democracy, this this, this concept that in detail. So John defines the monetary de democracy as a power sharing, public scrutiny, taming or constraining authority by citizen, and self-governing of public institution. So he's a very uh, cautious, very realistic. At the beginning of his book, he said, monetary democracy is not the sense of CCP. CCP don't like it. So he, he, he realized that. But he hoped there will be a slow boat to monetary democracy in the end of the, his book. And uh, this is, of course, is a, uh, 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 a hypothesis. He really spent more than 10 pages uh, to speculate how monetary democracy will come to China. So here I think that John, on this matter, indeed, his John's major con contribution is a, as a political theory. That is, he asks us, forget about election-centric democratization approach. Let's develop a new approach that's the monetary path towards democracy. Now that's his main conceptual contribution. That is, open our new way to think about democracy and democratization in the Chinese context. So beyond two-party competition and election, John attempts to find a way of a new type of accountability and monetary in the authoritarian society, which the term he does not like it, thus offers a valuable lesson or tips for other similar society, even for democratic society. So here I think there are several issues, challenging issues. One issue, one issue on this issue, it is great pity uh, John has not uh, done a substantive empirical work of the monetary democracy experiment in China. At the village level, they already developed uh, this monetary democracy in the last 
30 years. There's a very good empirical evidence there are such practices already fully developed. And there are, there are Chinese citizens submitted a collective petition signed by in 2008, 10,000, more 10,000, demanding to establish accountable government. They call Wenzhe Zhengfu. Even they said the government have account, accountable to build a cheap apartment for ordinary citizens. So there are even some successful cases that NGOs against building the dam and they appeal the high official who revoke the decision. So there are many kind of cases, monetary uh, cases already happen. So really we need uh, um, to, 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 to look at those, how, how exactly those has take place, how they develop, what lesson we can learn. Then based on that, then we, let's speculate. Without those empirical foundations, then speculation, I, I feel uncertain. So here I, I think there's a number of issues probably that, uh, given the uh, time constraint. Then we need to study the, 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 the condition mechanism. Why several cases Chinese citizens full, successfully develop monetary mechanism? Why in many cases they fail? No, we need to say. The other issue so far, all those uh, 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 monetary mechanisms only successful at local level not at the central level. So there's a scale issue. How you scale up from the local to the center. And currently, there's other issue is really important. There's an official version of monetary mechanism. So for example, Beijing government, Beijing People's Congress passed the regulation of the administrative rentals in on 2011. Even today, now they have constitutional revision. It's constitutional revision, they add a new mechanism, state monetary organization. So how does this state version kind of monetary mechanism play out? In particular, more complicated, there's international dimension. There are emerging several kind of international non-government organizations that aim to monitor Chinese overseas investment. Take, for example, new power auditing, new power audit of EU and China relation. That's, a, that's one of them. So, so if, we, if we take all those, the Chinese citizen uh, monetary official version, international dimension, then how we understand how the monetary democracy could develop? The, uh, I think you raise a so important issue. Let's beyond this election. Let's look at the, how this will happen. But then the critical issue, I, I don't think I'll, I'll have time because it's too complicated. Then we need to move up another conceptualization. So there, that is a, even reflect the idea of monetary democracy. Here I come to the very rough idea that's really come against your, the, uh, 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 your uh, central uh, uh, thing of your book. You, you ask us drop authoritarianism. Then I will say, it's, it's a more, if you look at the Chinese uh, accountability monetary, it's like a kind of authoritarian model of monetary mechanism. You might don't like it, but then I, but I, I, I have a kind of detailed argument. But let, let me end, tell you the, uh, 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 a very small story. So, John asks us, stop use the term authoritarianism. This certainly has many intellectual merits as a, a, a kind of authoritarian, as a kind of very simple no, notion, really prevent us from understanding many Chinese uh, innovative experience. Also, overlook the diversity, variety of the regimes. How can you put North Korea, China together? Both are authoritarian system, but that's complete difference. So if you use authoritarian, discuss both North Korea, China, that's unfair intellectually. So, so does he have, uh, have menace? But however, the key feature for Chinese politics, indeed, is authoritarian, despite its uh, mutation. So the party propaganda department set up a correct line, even banned the term. Like civil society, constitutionalism, those terms you cannot be used. Even the term authoritarianism, you cannot be used 
in, in, in Chinese text, textbook to describe Chinese political systems. I, I had a Chinese book last year about deliberate democracy, so I use the term that Chinese is authoritarian system, but an authoritarian system we can develop the local deliberate democracy. So I call it terms uh, authoritarian deliberation. But then the book was rejected. They have a review. Review said that the, 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 the authors use authoritarianism to describe Chinese political systems. That's the wrong. This is against the party's uh, correct line. So the, the fact that my book is a censor on such ground that the book, the, the book holder kind of this kind of use the term authoritarianism probably confirm the great value of the term authoritarianism still being used uh, to China. So then the finally probably I, I think come back to these uh, um, issues uh, with the, the uh, issue I think is important. Probably we can still use the term authoritarianism, but we can add an adjective, say the deliberative authoritarianism or electoral authoritarianism. Even democratic authoritarianism to describe the complexity. So if we use those, those terms, that will force us, force Australia policymaker, develop a complex foreign policy towards China, rather a simple policy to, towards China, which is based on simplistic ideological line. Thank you very much. I'm an old-fashioned social democrat, and I've still got to be persuaded, John, that there's a different definition from one that says, one that says democracy entails free and fair elections where the people are able to throw out a government. That's my challenge. I'm stuck on that definition. And when it comes to a shorthand working definition of a system like China's, authoritarian keeps intruding. Authoritarian keeps intruding. It's going to be very hard. Uh, it's going to be very hard to shrug that off. Mm. But there are many, oh, yeah, many interesting <laughs> concepts laid out on the table here by you and our discussant, who says maybe an adjective in front of authoritarian um, does the trick. Bao Gang, you suggested a, um, oh, a, um, a deliberative authoritarian system might describe China. So John, what sort of a response is your book getting? It's very provocative, especially in a country that's been through an anti-China panic. Um, and some people saying we've got to take a more, some people urging what can be described as an ideological approach to China mm -hmm. and America, America getting jealous and adversarial about China's rise. What, 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 what are they, they saying about something as provocative as this notion that, that China is a system with democratic elements? Nobody says anything. Um, but, you know, that's a little comment on Australian public life at the moment and the, you know, the, the, the China discussion. Peter Harcher was very kind in the Sydney Morning Herald um, <coughs> about the book. Um, I hadn't quite realized, every book has this quality, that when you're writing it, you never can anticipate the context into which it's born. <laughs> I hadn't quite realized that it would step into a big public row um, about this global empire called China. Uh, and what, but it still seems to me, I dig my heels in on this one, that the, the concept of authoritarianism, whose genealogy I tried to, to trace, um, is actually being used as a weapon in this um, push to, 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 to pick a fight to start a new Cold War. And I think that uh, I hadn't quite realized uh, when um, thinking, rethinking, reimagining China, I hadn't quite realized um, 
uh, how significant potentially that deconstruction, that pulling apart of that rather strange category um, might turn out to be. The category, by the way, um, is not only for me um, questionable, especially when, by the way, all the adjectives are added. I mean, some of them are oxymoronic. Um, uh, I'm not sure about deliberative authoritarianism and what it actually means. There's a whole proliferation of adjectives, which for me is a sign that a category is having a nervous breakdown, uh, and I try to sort of push that. But the, 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 the objection is not only empirical, that is, you know, that when China is dubbed an authoritarian system, Professor Snape does it in every interview. Um, it just misses the fact, as Bao Gang has rightly pointed out, that there are all these locally made democratic practices that are called that, and, and one needs respectfully to look at them and to see why um, and how they function. But it's also that um, the category is a carrier of a norm, and the norm is the United States, um, whose democracy, like more than a few, is in a parlous state. And that's why, wickedly, at the very end, I tacked on the sting in the tail, saying, you know, actually, maybe, if you ever thought of this, that, you know, the United States is developing some Chinese qualities uh, in terms of plutocracy and lawlessness and well, well, the, the abuse of the, arbitrary... The president, the president spoke warmly at mar el Lago about the notion of the two-term limit being removed. Sure, said, every emperor... It should happen in more countries. Every emperor, empire needs an emperor, yes. But there's also, this is a technical point, boring uh, probably for um, most of you, that um, what I don't like is the bowdlerization of the key terms that are very precious in our political traditions between authority and power. So when Sam Huntington used the term, he said that um, a system of authoritarianism is a system of power where those who rule authorize themselves to rule. But in Chinese um, and in um, European languages, the difference between Chen Wei and Chen Li is really important. That if you have power, you are not automatically authorized. Uh, to rule. And the concept, I say in the book, um, in a few pages, actually does damage to that very precious uh, distinction. And not only that, one last sentence, I think that, um, if I'm right, the learning party um, is very well aware um, of the dangers of conflating that distinction. There is, and that's the when trees fall, monkey scatter point that power, when arbitrarily exercised, can and does produce blindness. It produces hubris, and it produces follies and mistakes. And not surprisingly, out of 282 emperors, that what we call China, uh, is what we call today uh, China, out of 282, half of the emperors died of natural causes in office, but 76 um, were pushed from office. And that thought is frightening to many Chinese Communist Party members, and hence the attention paid right. to the loyalty. And yeah, I just think that the concept of authoritarianism just doesn't help, it's not helpful in, on any of those fronts. And because it's a weapon in this new Cold War, it is, it, it's, it's become a major barrier to talking with Beijing. It has policy and political implications, and we ought to junk it. Because, because it's a conversation. I'm, I'm going stronger. to invite questions of uh, you and, and Bao Gang. Uh, but just one, one tip on America as someone who's been, who follows America closely and has for a long time. Uh, the notion that America is a democracy, America is a democracy. Here's what I think is a better way of understanding the American system. America is a republic. America is a republic under a constitution which has some democratic elements and which in addition has a robust constitutional guarantee of free speech. Now think about that. I think we're in difficulty describing America as a democracy when more and more often a president's going to be elected with a minority vote, when the Senate is getting close to having 70% of its American citizens represented by uh, having 30% of America's voters elect 70% of its senators, uh -huh. 
because of urbanisation and the influence of smaller states. And when you think about the, uh, the gerrymandered lower house and state governments in America passing regulations that make it harder for poor people to vote. I think a better definition of what America's got, falling a long way short of democracy as we know it in Australasia and Western Europe, is to say that America is a republic under a constitution that has some democratic features and with, to its great pride, its great credit, a constitution with a robust guarantee of freedom of speech. Any questions about two speakers? Over here. Oh, yes, thanks. Um, what does it matter for Australia if China does remain authoritarian? How does it affect our national interest if trade continues? You know, what, what is the difference? Is it, um, is it the argument of a fifth column, as Clive Hamilton is suggesting, or is there something else that threatens us as a democracy? Well, well can I answer this with this, make a stab at answering this? Uh, when Whitlam opened relations with China in 1972, it was with the China more authoritarian, to use the term, than the current China. Well, Mao was in charge, it was still in the grip of the Cultural <coughs> Revolution. It resembled North Korea more than China today. No Chinese could travel overseas. You couldn't, you couldn't move from one village to the other without the approval of the party. And no one could own anything. There's no private property. China's been transformed, but nonetheless, Prime Ministers Whitlam and Fraser and then Hawke and Keating and Howard opted to have a thoroughgoing relationship with a China that, in Australian terms, was never going to advertise that it could not advertise that it was a democracy. Could, when, and when, when Whitlam, I'll finish with this sentence, when, when Nixon and Kissinger opened America's relations with the People's Republic of China, they didn't believe for a moment that because of that China was going to become like America. They wanted a, they wanted a diplomatic relationship with, with what was a totalitarian Maoist state. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I say something also to, to back this up and go further, perhaps? Uh, I, I, again, to repeat, um, it seems to me that um, the category uh, of authoritarianism is a conversation stopper, and it's ignorant. And um, when you're traveling, uh, and talking to intellectuals and journalists and others in China, um, eyebrows are raised courteously about uh, the, the, the lack of ignorance about how things work here. So this was one point of trying to um, bury the category. Mm. I do think that um, uh, it's also this reliance on the category of authoritarianism. Professor Snape does it all the time. Um, turns a blind eye to the problem the really developing serious problem of the need for us to clean up our Algian stables of democracy. Things are not going well, and if you think this is paradise in our country, think on these. We have a constitution that needs reforming, partly because it carries uh, insults to indigenous peoples and because of this ridiculous citizenship criteria. Um, for young people, 400,000 young people have gone missing from the electoral rolls. Um, we have a precariat developing. We have a revolving doors problem in Canberra and in the capitals. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done to clearing up. Uh, the problem is, when you trumpet the view that China is a system authority and we're a democracy, it, it actually um, uh, turns blind eyes away from, from that effort. I want, uh, and I, one last thing um, about Whitlam and China. Um, Stephen Fitzgerald, who was present at the meeting with Zhou Enlai and Gough Whitlam, recalls, um, this is Jiang Yo in practice, speaking frankly to people. Um, and that is the basis of a solid friendship. Recalls that Zhou Enlai, in front of a press pack, pleads with Australia to come on the side of China and to leave the American sphere of influence. And Goff says, no. That takes guts, but it's done with courtesy, and it was not done with you know, arrogance. We are a democracy and you are some kind of totalitarian power. No. So that Zhou Enlai moment um, is also, it seems to me, an important ingredient, and it's what runs through this book. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a Zhou Enlai moment where I'm mm -hmm. saying, stop, stop um, 
in the West behaving as if, you know, we are the paradise center of democracy and you are a poor authoritarianism, you know, yep. clean up your yeah. house. Thanks, John. Yeah, Bao Gang. Yeah. You want to say something to add to that? No, I, I definitely I agree with John this uh, several remark, like conversation stuff indeed. And, but uh, what I want to add is this, uh, I agree with you that when the Australia established diplomatic relation with the China at that time, the Chinese authoritarian system was, does not uh, become obstacle. But uh, what's, what's really interesting, we need to look at this uh, international relation discipline in the last decades. What is so-called uh, uh, English school of the international relation. They uh, slowly, slowly they introduce a very strong normative concept. Even once they suggest- What concept? Concept. The idea is that UN members must be, all must be democratic. If, uh, if, if you're not a democratic country, you should not be entitled to be a member of UN. Mm. That concept slowly, slowly spread. Mm. And it became a, a, a source kind of nonsense common sense. And uh, now that's, that's a really interesting this phenomenon develop. That is uh, 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 become a, a basis for... Redefining as the UN as a, quote, community of democracies. That's right, unquote. that's right. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and this idea even adopted by several policy makers. Yeah. yeah, okay, up here. Uh, thanks, John and Bao Gang and Bob. Um, John, the forms of democracy or the processes that you talked about that I guess um, have helped to build resilience in China have evolved and emerged over 20 or more years. Uh, but we've been getting some pretty thrilling news out of China recently. Do you think the last, looking back the last three years or five years, have really been more of the same of what you've described in the book? Or do you see them as pushing back on some of those trends that have underpinned resilience in China? Yeah, we're going to see, and I, um, my, my warning in the introduction was, you know, don't, don't um, uh, do what so many journalists do, which is to concentrate, you know, on the great leader and, and all the machinations of the great leader, because the great leader is uh, not only um, concerned, anxious about abuse of power and the hubris that come, can come with it, but remember that this um, power jockeying and maneuvering takes place in a very complex kaleidoscopic system. I think it is an open question whether these locally made democratic practices that I've tried to summarize and, and Baogang went further, it remains an open question whether they will be shut down. My, my prediction is that they will not because, because no party can govern a very complex political economy that is already multi-layered and, and is in the process of going global. Yeah. It, 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 it cannot, you know, centralized one-man rule is not viable. And Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I just uh, add some empirical evidence to support you. So I did uh, this uh, uh, follow-up, the deliberate, local deliberate democracy experiment. Looks at the number of the public documents, official local government documents on the holding the public meeting or the report public meeting or the decision about public meeting or the procedure about public meeting, those number. So in the last 20 years, in particular on the Xi Jinping period. So from the 2012 still go up, last of you drop a little bit, but not a lot, mm. still there. And uh, the, the, this, I, I was, uh, from the Zhejiang last, last year. So Zhejiang want to kind of uh, uh, spread this uh, kind of, what we call the participatory, uh, the, the participatory budgeting. They want to spread uh, uh, at a uh, whole the province. So idea is to kind of monitor this uh, local budget, township, because there will be serious issue. Local debt is an issue. Mm -hmm. So then they will want to involve citizen, the local deputy to monitor the whole process. So this is after necessity, what you just say. It's a necessity, they have to do so. Yeah, question over here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your presentations and the fantastic discussion. I have a question that's just occurred to me, and that is that when um, I travel to China and I work in China, uh, you often talk about administrative reforms. So people don't talk very much about political reforms, they talk about administrative reforms like um, participatory budgeting and things like that. That always, to me, I always found that sort of disingenuous because I'm a political scientist, so you think, well, that's really politics, isn't it? Okay, if you're talking about participatory reform and things like that. But more recently, I've been thinking that it probably makes sense to draw that distinction between administrative reform on the one hand and political reform on the other. It's taken me a while to reach that conclusion because of my background and my training. But um, so I guess another way of saying that is that you can say that devolution and decentralisation is good for central governments, whether they're authoritarian or not. So I wanted to know what you thought about the distinction between administration on the one hand and politics on the other when it comes to talking about and describing accurately or otherwise the types of reforms that we're seeing in China. Thanks. Yeah. That you were talking about. Yeah, I, I, I did a paper a long time ago, um, it's well started, discuss the three, uh, three ways of understanding like uh, participatory in budgeting. One way is uh, pure look at administrative for efficiency, control the budget. The other is a, a process of the politics. The other is uh, from perspective of uh, empowerment, citizen empowerment. So all those three logics going on. And uh, the stronger one is uh, the administrative logic is a stronger but other two a little bit of something there yeah in china everything is political and i think <laughs> i think i think the distinction is actually not I, I don't think it's so meaningful because every administered reform of course it has a strategic uh, set of goals to it's always party centered and so on um, but this party shows signs of wanting to build into the administrative reform process um, some monitoring mechanism, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some supervision, jiandu, uh, jiandu, 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 uh, mechanisms. And uh, a case in point, maybe not so well known, is that, you know, when it comes to matters of the politics of environment, China reminds me of Dickens. It's, it's the worst of worlds and it's the best of worlds. You know, <laughs> the, the environmental despoliation that I have seen is shocking. And yet, um, uh, a couple of days after, um, the great leader in Washington says that he's not gonna, not gonna support the Paris process. Governor Jerry Brown gets on a plane and goes to see Xi, and they sign a multi-billion dollar uh, contract for the greening of the respective economies. Um, and in matters of administration and politics, this works its way out in China, for instance, where at um, regional and local and city levels, the party is backing NGOs that are blowing the whistle on companies that are violating law. That's right, yeah. Mm. And you have to understand that complexity right, of China. Yeah. So that is a case where a party is a driver of fa zhe, rule of law, because of the environmental destructiveness of the company and actually the China model, right, yeah. mm -hmm. and is prepared, therefore, to, so to say, um, sublease power um, of a group that's sanctioned by the party to actually pursue a company in court. To an uh, environmental NGO. Yes. Um, who attract young lawyers, by the way, and there are many, many recorded cases of this that are happening and will continue to happen given the yeah. scale of that's despoliation. Right. Yeah. So here's a case where the politics mm -hmm. administration you know, distinction I think mm. is not quite helpful. Okay, over here. Okay, uh, uh, I just make some uh, several comments. So the first, uh, uh, I remember at the end of, at the end of the Cold War, uh, the American uh, scholar Fukuyama said the end of history, but later he acknowledged that he was wrong. I think it's very simple because uh, history never ends and it's still in evolution. So people will should be open have an open minded to the future. And then uh, uh, I think democracy is a common pursuit, uh, but maybe have different practice in different countries. And, uh, but I think a more valuable uh, question is, uh, is uh, bad governors or good governors. I think there are also some uh, 
concrete standards. Uh, if you if uh, if the system can uh, uh, boost productivity or the the the, the deliver the well-being to the people or the uh, safeguard the prosperity of the country or even more uh, to make contribution to the world peace and the prosperity i think it's a very simple uh, standards and uh, and i came from brussels uh, i was there 5 years so i i witnessed that in many countries this anti establishment uh, this uh, populism is surging uh, and many democratic governments uh, fail to deliver job and growth. So I think the scholar, Western scholars, also including uh, uh, Professor He, could um, uh, make more study uh, on that <coughs> issue. And last but not least, I agree with uh, uh, Professor Zhang Qin on this uh, proverb, his history pro uh, proverb of China that uh, the government is a boat and the uh, people is a water and the water can sink the boat. So I think to some extent this is uh, this accountability, the sense of accountability of the leadership of China I think is deep in the heart, not only uh, how say the regulated by by the by a uh, by a system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. I think they stand w without a response. We are pressed for time. We are pressed for time. But I can give you this this commitment. I think this discussion has been so lively. We should, in a couple of months, resume it. And there will be, I'm certain, be a lot more to talk about given developments in the U.S. and in China and the relationship between between them and how it's reflected in Australia. Uh, year of the China Development Society at uh, Yezhou from the China Development si Society at Sydney University, whose members we welcome tonight. Right, thanks for your introduction and thanks for the excellent uh, presentation from both professors. My question is about China's democratic process. Do you think um, China's social structure will impact China's uh, democratic democratization in the future? When I talk about um, social stru structure, it refers to Fei Xiaotong's um, description of China's social structure, Cha Xu Geju, the smoke and hop pattern. Yeah, that is my question. Thank you. Thanks, well, um, <clears throat> this is another lecture, another session. Maybe a whole series of, <laughs> oh, it's a great question. Uh, let me just answer uh, with respect to one, one dynamic. Um, it's the question within China, it's the question of the middle class. You know, there, the, there is a long literature in, and Fukuyama still actually is attracted to it, uh, in political science that basically says, um, Barrington Moore put it succinctly in one of the shortest sentences ever written by modern social scientists, no bourgeois, no democracy. So if you don't have a middle class, um, you can't have democracy. Um, while the Chinese middle class is growing fast, it's at least 250, 300 self-ascribed middle class, maybe 400, maybe larger uh, in future. And according to the Western political science, American-led view, um, when you have a middle class like this, at some point, they're going to um, spit the dummy, as we say here, and they're going to say, well, we want free and fair elections. Actually, um, the history of the middle classes, I think, shows comparatively globally that the middle classes are much more promiscuous than that. And that uh, that wasn't the case in Russia. And I think China is a test case. The evidence that we have, and there are growing numbers of studies, is that the self-described middle class in China, part of the social structure, um, wants, um, it does not like um, overt interferences into family life and of the party and into property arrangements and it wants holidays and it wants shopping malls and so on. But it also wants accountable government. It does not like um, corruption and many applaud the anti-corruption campaign that's going on. And final element, they don't much like, according to the surveys, free and fair elections uh, at the national level. And in these times, they just simply raise their hands and say, why would we ever want 
a political system like the United States, where dark money and plutocracy and uh, so on produces a big mouth, you know, who's dangerous for the global order. I mean, this is a serious question. So um, I, I think um, what I'd say in the book is that be prepared for the possibility that this middle class loyalty um, is secured to one party rule. Yeah. Okay, last so, point to you. Do you agree with that, that assessment? Yeah, I first... As, as uh, you, particularly, that, particularly interested in knowing whether you think yeah, that's the, that's right, that's the yeah. majority opinion, yeah. the consensus right. opinion, right. opinion of Chinese middle class yeah. people. So, this is a really excellent question. We have a multiple dimension of our social structure. But the first point I think I, I, I need to make, I just come back from Japan, observe how the, both China and the Japanese society operate. So if you look at just the gender relation, human relation, Chinese are more democratic than Japanese society in societal relation. If in societal relation, Chinese are more democratic than the Japanese. That, that's a, a, but when it comes to this issue, I, I agree with the John, but I want to add this very uh, provocative uh, uh, questions and also remark. Come back to John's early remark about empire. So if you look at the United States, why the United States did not have a strong labor movement? Why the United States does not have a strong left forces? Mm. Australia, you have a labor party. British have a labor party. In Europe, you have a very strong labor party. But in the United States, the uh, radical left it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very difficult to compare Austria Europe of weight. Mm. Why? Simple. American empire, its economic power go everywhere. Middle class benefit American empire. Similar situation might mm. happen towards Chinese it's middle class. Uh. China become empire. That's, that's empire's run on this strong central authority. That is the promoter, say today, one bell, one road. And uh, then the Chinese middle class benefit. So they will are uh, more likely in this kind of empire system because they are benefit, benefit from the everywhere. They are probably more tend to support a strong kind of centralized authority. So this same logic might be operate in a similar but a slight different way. Okay, that's, that's a terrific thought. I've got no alternative but to cut our discussion off at this point tonight because we've gone over time and we could easily go on for another, another hour, I suspect. But I will give you this promise, and as you know, the reason you kept re-electing me as Premier, I never broke any of my promises. <laughs> <laughs> we will, be, we sure. will be back with the same topic. What can we say, Daniel? You, have, you, you direct our program in two months. Can we mobilise these in two months? And there will, be, there will be, I'm sure, a lot a, more a to, uh, <laughs> to canvas. Terrific discussion. We're indebted, indebted to both of you. Thanks for coming up from Melbourne, <laughs> Bao Gang. And, and John, thank you, one of the leading academics on democracy in the world. Thank you for pleasure, giving us your time my pleasure. as well. Uh, when trees fall, monkeys scatter. We haven't got them on sale here, but make a note of it. There are a half a dozen copies, apparently, uh, somewhere that, okay. uh, that give away now, now, final advertisement. I won't detain you a minute, but look at what's coming up in the ACRI calendar. Another <coughs> panel discussion on Australian Chinese. <coughs> and something, something that you might not have expected, yeah, we we're going to have a discussion on what China can learn from Australia's management of its rangelands, its grazing country for cattle and sheep, how China can avoid dust storms. And we've got, we've got some excellent Australian agricultural scientists who worked in China for 20 to 30 years, providing a panel. So that's, that's looking at environmental management cooperation between Australia and China. And then many of you have got Hong Kong backgrounds. I know we've got China from a Hong Kong perspective with Ivan Chu speaking, speaking to us on April the 20th, looking from China, it's looking from Hong Kong, particularly at the Pearl River Delta, and telling us what's going on, this transformation of the whole region. Um, and he's a fascinating speaker, but it all leads to our, leads to our big event in May, uh, when we're honoured to be hosting the Governor of the Reserve Bank, 
and uh, please make a note and come along and hear Philip Lowe. But thank you for coming tonight. Thank you very much.